right for this, this little time that we carve out here, maybe once a week or a couple times a, a month, but to make it a, a lifestyle, a life altering, changing, you know, that, that this concept of Christianity to worship Jesus that changes everything about even our home life. So I'm going to give you three things, three things for you to kind of dream, to pray, to challenge you this morning about your home life. So, number one, my big dream for you is that you would worship God and chase after holiness more and more in your home. So kind of two parts there, worship God and then chase after this idea of holiness more and more. You'd pursue it even in your own home, not just on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night or during Sunday school, but you would make that a priority, a pursuit in your own life. Now we're going to get specific in a little bit. But I want to start off general here to everybody. This can apply to everybody from teens to adults. That we are to make worship daily a priority. To be in the Word. To not just be uh, watching the, the, the news or streaming things. But to be running after, chasing after holiness more than or just as much as we know our culture around us. That you would not be satisfied with little sin habits that creep in or, or things you see on those streaming videos that are not Christian-like, but you'd be uh, disgusted by them. The anti-God talk or images and want to radically cut them out and pursue God. And all these things, uh, worship, holiness, this idea of kind of more and more and chasing and running after that comes right from the Word of God. I'm going to show you this morning. Each one of these points, these dreams, these challenges, we're going to look to the Word of God to see how it informs our home life. So turn with me if you're Bibles. We're going to jump around a bit. We'll have some of the screens too, but we'll jump around to first Romans chapter 12. We, we looked at Romans 12, verse 2 last week, but I want to focus now on Romans 12, verse 1. We'll read both verses, but look with me at Romans 12. Paul, who's saying this, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, the book of Romans is often seen as one of Paul's kind of most important uh, magnum opus, kind of big book of theology and doctrine, and the gospel, what is the good news of Jesus. He's been explaining those things for the first 11 chapters. This is God's beautiful, amazing grace to you that you don't have to be good enough and give enough for God, but he has done all that already for you through the person of Jesus, his goodness, his righteousness, you need to come confess your sin and believe in Jesus and what he did on the cross then, that you can be saved. And he says, therefore, in verse 1, therefore, because of all that God has done for you, you should do this because of the mercies of God, you should present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, this, this is strange wording here for a number of reasons. First off, we... We're not used to sacrifice a lot, right? We don't sacrifice things here up on the stage like, please, please stop bringing me your goats and sheep to sacrifice in my backyard, okay? Um, your neighbor's cats and dogs, I, I've done that before, I won't. No, I'm kidding, I don't do that, and I won't do that. 
We don't do that, right? Because of Jesus' own sacrifice on the cross. But he tells us sacrifice, a living sacrifice, and he says you, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And that's weird because sacrifices die. You, you would take a goat or a sheep or a dove and you would kill it. But it says, you be a living sacrifice. This is worship, he says. So it's this every single day, every single hour, minute activity of laying down your life, sacrificing yourself toward God, because of all that he has done for you, the great mercies and love he has for you, you will joyfully come and say, God, I give you every single day to worship you. And verse 2, as we talked about, that there is this different, other, worldly, our culture, I mean, propagated by evil forces, even Satan behind this, it says, don't conform to this world. Daily you must Lay down your life. Pick up your cross, as Jesus said. And then you'll be able to renew, transform your mind, become more and more. And I don't know about you, but this is a daily I mean, exercise that I must do every single day, week, month to make this happen in my own life. Begin the day this way. Wake up with your morning coffee and make it this little, little worship service. End the day this way. Before you go to sleep, pray, put on worship music. Uh, one of my favorite uh, Christian movies that I, I think I've talked about often is, is The War Room. If you haven't seen it, it's a great movie that just encourages you to think about praying for your own sake, but your family's sake too. It's basically a closet this woman turns into a prayer room and just has all these posters, stickers up about things she prays for and calls it her war room because she's constantly going to war and battle. Find a spot, find a place in your house to make it your, your war room, your worship room to come daily to him. And radically cut out. Do not conform to this world. Cut out any sin habits or other idols or things you have in your own life. Now, I know, I know we're getting to fall, right, as I said, and fall has kickoffs, right? I mean, like, there was a big game yesterday, Iowa, Iowa State, right? Anybody watch the game yesterday? A few of you? Oh, man, that's not very enthusiastic. I mean, like, I know, like, the Iowa fans are like, we can't score more than seven points, and the Iowa State fans are like, I guess we beat them, but it wasn't by much. But, but I mean, I, I'm a huge Bears fan. I love watching the Chicago Bears. But I, I tell you, I am not as much as a worshiping Bears fan as like the Packers, Chiefs fans that are out there, right? It's not like today when the Bears kick off and I'm going to be coaching my son's soccer game that I'm going to have like an earbud in listening to their game or anything. No. I mean, I joke about that, right? But there are things in our life that we, we give our time to, our money to, or that can become idols, other forms of worship. Shelby, I'm going to invite you to come on up here. Shelby's going to come up and read our next passage that talks about not just this worship idea, but this idea of chasing after God more and more in this holiness idea. She's going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an, is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. 
For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing in all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Thank you, Shelby. This is similar to that Romans passage, right? Paul is writing this again. He's saying to now this, this church that he founded in Thessalonica, this relationship that he has from them, he said, I'm urging you, I'm, I'm just, I'm pleading with you, brothers and sisters, that you would do this. <clears throat> and he keeps using this phrase more and more, that you would do this, you'd pursue this more and more in your life. This phrase means richly, abundantly, that you would just do this in a rich way, abundantly, that you keep pursuing God. And what does he keep talking about? That you would chase after him, you'd walk after and please God, but your sanctification, controlling your own body and holiness and honor, that God has called us to holiness and brotherly love. All of these things, sanctification, it means to be uh, made holy, to be like God, to be set apart, to be different, honor, holiness. Does this describe your own home life? The way you talk, the way uh, or the things you watch, does chasing after holiness describe those things? Now, sometimes we associate holiness with this kind of, um, I don't know, kind of quiet, um, reserved, <laughs> even like talking in an English accent sometimes. Like I, I, I read sometimes a lot of these older books by the, the Puritans, and their way of talking about holiness is just so foreign to me sometimes. They are so convinced that every single sin needs to be cut out and to watch yourself. I'm not asking you to be, be Amish and, and Puritan and just live a life in the country, and as good as that may sound sometimes, but take these verses seriously. I mean, Paul, he, he looks at them square in the eye, and one of the things he calls out is sexual immorality. He, he says that there's this direct correlation in verse 3 and 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, you being holy like God, that you abstain from sexual immorality. I, I do a lot of pre-marriage counseling, and it's just the norm now. It's just, I expect it, and then I get it from every couple I talk to, that sex before marriage, living together, cohabitating is the norm. And, and we live in a culture that sexual morality is, is held up and celebrated and makes billions and billions of dollars. I'm speaking to everybody here, but there is a problem, an epidemic in our world with pornography. Men, women, especially toward men. I would not be surprised at statistics that even from our own church of men looking at pornography. It is a huge thing. It is a shameful thing that men feel and we feel. And so I ask you, I urge you, I plead with you that you fight, chase after holiness against that. If you have struggled with that at all, please tell someone, get help. Come talk to me or someone else on staff or an elder. Let's, let's move on here to number two, though. I would love to see, I'll get more specific to your home, I would love to see you work together to pursue God's good, fulfilling, and better purposes for your marriage. So I'm going to be talking to couples here, to married couples if you're not married, you know, please don't just check out or go to sleep. Use this to inform your prayer life, to pray for people in our church because marriages more and more are being attacked, 
broken apart. I'm seeing a lot of this lately. I, I just plead with you, please, pray for our marriages at Lighthouse and in our community here. You know, it seems like today that we, we hear more about divorce in the news, just as much as people getting married. I mean, Tom Brady and Giselle may be separating, right? Or, or marriage is it's just not that important. People are just moving in together. What's, what's the point of even getting married? I believe God created marriage. He has a purpose for it. But notice I use this word. It is work. Work together to pursue God's purpose. Even though it's God's purpose, it is good, fulfilling, and better, it is still work. It takes time. It takes effort. There are so many other reasons, purposes out there for why people get married or stay married. Oh, I fell in love. Sex. Oh, they just, they, they complete me. He makes me laugh. <laughs> oh. We got pregnant. I mean, everybody else is doing it, right? We should probably just get married because they're doing it, right? We're I'd be happiness. I just, I want to be happy, so I'll get married. Here's some ones that I found, like, online about the family. The purpose of a first family is to imprint its members with information necessary to create an improved second family. That's the reason why if you give a family, get married. It's to give you a safe and supportive base from which to explore the world. So, so what does God say? What, what is the purpose? And I, I found three purposes to marriage. Because this is so important for us as believers to know what, why am I married? Why am I staying married? And how do I have a fulfilling, good, better marriage than the world's view of marriage? So purpose one. Purpose one to pursue in your marriage or to pray for in other people's marriages is community and intimacy. Pursue that companionship, that, that friendship. Let's go way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2. Where God first invents, creates marriage. He says one of the very first things is community and the intimacy that it produces. Genesis 2. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds and, and the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, Wow. <laughs> he says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, in our upcoming Genesis series, we'll, we'll kind of dig into this more and different parts to this. But we're just right now, we're looking at Purpose here of marriage. Purpose, community, intimacy. He begins with this general idea in verse 18 that it's not good for man, I think you could say humanity, for anybody to be alone. There, there's no need for, for hermits or I know like some of you are super introverted. You'd be great just to be alone for a long time, but we're not made to be alone. 
And, and God does this thing where he kind of presents Adam with all of these animals to, to name and to kind of, I think, teach him that no animal can quite fulfill your need for companionship, right? We talk about like man's best friend being a dog. Um, no, I mean, he, he may have like presented all these different like pairs, right? Like a, a doe and a, a buck and maybe he got after a while like there's no pair for me or or maybe you you think like wives out there like man my husband is just so hairy like he's just like a gorilla maybe he just needs a gorilla to be with like no we need each other to be in community marriage was not made by by the government or by schools or by the church even or your in-laws it was created by god Do you pursue that in your own marriage? Community, companionship, date nights, <laughs> time the two of you. You know, don't be that couple that if you have kids now, that when your kids all leave, you have nothing left for each other. But this last few verses also, he talks about this leaving of mom and dad and and cleaving to each other being one flesh and then even just this this picture of of marriage it's so beautiful that they're naked and not ashamed there's just this what i'm gonna call intimacy it's not just sex but it's this vulnerable spiritual emotional vulnerability so often what happens in marriages is something maybe traumatic, chaotic happens and, and a spouse may go to somebody else for emotional intimacy, vulnerability, and maybe just talking or texting or whatever, but then that creates more and more and more problems. But seek that, pursue that in your own marriage to have emotional vulnerability. Number two. This is even more probably surprising and strange and odd to our culture and everything else. Gary Thomas, 2000, wrote a book. It was called Sacred Marriage. This is in the year 2000. It's so relevant for today. Here's, here's what he says. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? So purpose two is holiness. Pursue together holiness in your marriage. Uh, Gary Thomas goes on, he says, the key question is this, will we approach marriage from a God-centered view or a man-centered view? If in a man-centered view, we will maintain our marriage as long as our earthly comforts, desires, and expectations are met. In a God-centered view, we preserve our marriage because it brings glory to God and points a sinful world to a reconciling creator. The Bible clearly doesn't tell us to pursue happiness with the same force it tells us to pursue righteousness, character, holiness, and integrity. For those of you who know, who've been married for more than a day, you know that marriage is not easy and sometimes you might get on each other's nerves. You're different, right? And, and we are there to help each other to grow spiritually, to learn how selfish we truly are when we live with somebody else. My, my wife, Adrienne, over there, I, I am the sandpaper to her rough edges. She she is the, this is the worst example, she's a potato peeler to my lumps, right? I mean, like, we just complete each other by helping us get our rough, that was a terrible analogy. Let's move on. Okay, this passage we're going to read, I'm just going to warn you. Unless you've been to a church that, like, preached through 1 Corinthians, I don't think you've probably ever heard this passage in church. 1 Corinthians 7. I'm warning you, it is, it's out there, okay? Just warning you. Talks about sex. 1 Corinthians 7. 
We're looking for holiness, this idea of, of what can marriage do for us. Paul, he's so bold to say this to this church. They've been writing him questions, asking him different things. Here's their question. Now concerning the matter about which you wrote, they said, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That was a Corinthians idea. That, that was a question, their thought. Well, Paul says this. Well, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman her own husband. The woman should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. <laughs> As I'm reading that, like I feel myself starting to sweat a little more, like conjugal rights. Whew, okay, let's keep going here. Verse 8 also. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And then jump to verse 13. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such, place, in such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? There's a lot going on there in that passage, right? And we could even dig in deeper a lot, but he's talking to two groups, uh, married Christians and a married couple where one is not a Christian, both talking about holiness in their relationship, stopping sin, being more like Jesus, right? Um, for the married Christians, there's this protection against sexual immorality. There's this crazy thing about devoting yourselves to prayer. Like, go talk to your neighbor about that who's not a Christian. Like, hey, we tried this out. The Bible told us to devote ourselves to prayer by not being together. But it's protection against Satan's temptation and lack of self-control or this idea of making the other one holy. Now, saving a spouse doesn't mean like I'll get them to heaven, but there's this hope that they will listen and hear. But all of this I'm presenting to you as this idea that is there for holiness, that you are together to help sanctify each other to grow closer to be like Jesus. You can turn with me also to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll read a few verses now and then a few verses of it later. But again, look for these words like holiness and sanctification. He's talking to uh, husbands, to married Husbands, Christians, in verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Verse 27, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. He's comparing the, 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 the work that Jesus did with the church, with a husband's love for his own bride, and saying that Jesus did these things. He sanctified her, cleansed her with the word, making her holy, and that husbands, in a similar way to love their spouses, similarly to make them holy. One of the very simple things that I do every time I do premarriage counseling we, we talk about all kinds of things, communication, how do you fight well, I mean, all kinds of things. But I always talk to them about praying together. Most couples don't pray together that I talk to. Uh, maybe they did years ago, or they pray on their own. But simply, first thing in the morning, before bed, 
Take some time to pray together. Husband pray, wife pray, pray for each other, pray for your kids, pray for your, your friends, your neighbors. Very last purpose that I found in Scripture. There's companionship and, and intimacy. There's this idea of holiness, making sure they're holy. But also, your marriage is meant to be this form of evangelism to tell a watching world about Jesus. So again, Ephesians chapter 5. Let's start at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its Savior. Now the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, again, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Whoever lit each one of you love his wife as himself, let the wife see that she respects her husband. I know there's a lot of things in that passage that may trip you up or, or, or make you think or second guess. Talk about submission and what it means with respect and a wife or even as a husband, what it means to lay down your life and love as Christ did. But we're, we're looking here for, for purpose. Why, why did God make marriage? And look at all these times he talks about as. In the same way, just as. It refers to Christ and the church. Your marriages are meant to reflect Christ's relationship to the church, to a watching world, like a giant mirror to the world watching you, looking to you to see what is it like for Christians to be married, reflects Christ's love. Does your marriage reflect that? Can people looking at you, your friends, can they discern that in your own life? My, my last point this morning is, is shorter, but I wanted to spend so much time on this about marriage because I, I, I plead with you I beg of you that if your, your marriage is in any way hurting or, or, or even if you feel like you're, you're strong, seek out Christ in your marriage. Because, as I said, there are so many marriages and I see Satan's just attack on our marriages here. But please, please, don't be ashamed of, of getting help or asking a pastor for help. Finally, number three, they said it'll be shorter. Make the discipleship of your children a priority in your home. Joshua 24, a great passage to think about kind of for your home, says this, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is this great example of a godly leader, in the community, in battle, but in his home too. Husbands, men, fathers, you are called to lead your home spiritually. To lead them, to disciple, to run hard after Jesus yourself. 
and then to disciple your kids to know Jesus. That, that involves, you know, taking them to Awana or children's ministry or things like that, but it involves in your home too. I brought a picture of my family this morning. One of the things we did this summer uh, is we decided to do something different. We called it the Warner Institute of Theology, or WIT for short. And our goal was like twice a week, we're going to do this. And we did it like once every other week. But we took time as a family to sing some hymns together. My kids don't know hymns, really. So we, we taught them some hymns and sang them. Um, we did a Bible lesson, really simple. Talk about what is the Bible, who is God. We prayed together. Um, we, we worked on the Lord's Prayer together. I'm not, I'm not saying like, look at me, I'm the pastor and how great I am as a family. No, this is just an example of things we tried this summer. Find a way if you are a parent, if you are single parent or married, grandkids even, how will you disciple your kids at home? There are so many choices you have out there to do and activities to be a part of and I encourage you to make discipleship a priority. This whole series has been about dreaming, challenging, kind of throwing the, the gauntlet down for you to say, I want more in my life. I'm not satisfied. I want more Jesus. Holiness, worship, all those things. And that you would radically cut out sin, temptation, in your own life. And it's only through the power of Jesus and the gospel that we can achieve that. And through prayer. And so let me pray for you guys now that that would happen in your own life. Father, I praise you. I thank you. I adore you for who you are. And I ask God that as we uh, sing this last song as we leave this place, as we go into our work week this next week, that you would fill us, Holy Spirit, with a, a love for you, with a desire, a desire to desire you more every single day, that the Word of God would become active and alive in our lives, that we want to feast on that daily every single moment, and to pray and to be with you, and that it would come it affect our, our, our community groups, it would affect our marriages, affect our, our workplaces, our, our neighborhoods. God, would you bring revival and goodness and any sin or, or temptation, whether it be sexual morality or whatever that, that we're holding on to, God, would you cut that out? Would you help us to feel that godly guilt and shame to go to you and a friend to confess? Because you tell us that there is nothing else as good as you in this life and the plan you have for us in salvation. So we trust in you, Jesus, the work you've done on the cross and come to sing to you now and praise you and pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.